Dr. Dan Thomas. Thank you again, Don. Most of you have already gotten selfies with him already. I'm actually pretty jealous that you guys have been doing it already. But Don and I and, and uh, um, Carol had dinner last night, and I will tell you, this gentleman is is truly the salt of the earth. If you want to talk to somebody that has done great accomplishments and it's just part of every day, this is the type of person. Very honest, very straightforward, an amazing, amazing experience level. So what we're going to do is we're going to have uh, uh, Dr. Thomas here talk to everybody for about 45 minutes or so, and we'll open up to a 15-minute Q&A session. So I'll moderate the questions from the crowd. I'll walk around, raise your hand. We'll look for volunteers to ask questions. So I'm going to turn it over. Excuse me, losing my voice already. Turn over to Dr. Thomas. I'll be in the crowd, but it's all yours, sir. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you very much. Hey, oh, I'm good. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Hey, I'm really thrilled to be with you this morning. This is the first time I've been here for this event. I've met many of the students. It's like, what a, what a great group, what a great event. Looks like the weather's going to cooperate. So I'm just excited to be with you all this morning. As you heard, my name is Don Thomas, and I'm a former NASA astronaut, and I had the amazing opportunity to fly on four space shuttle missions. I was on Space Shuttle Columbia three times, and Space Shuttle Discovery once, I've spent a total of 44 days in space, and during that time, I went around the Earth all the way around 692 times. So I've seen a lot of our planet. It was really an incredible experience. And what I'm going to do this morning is to share with you a little bit about what it's like to live and work in space. We'll talk about how we eat and sleep up there. I'll show you some of my favorite pictures of the Earth taken from space. We'll talk about the landing. And then at the end, I want to take a few minutes just to highlight a few of NASA's programs in the future that some of you may have the opportunity to participate in. And then at the end, we'll take your questions. Sound good? You guys ready to head to space? Okay, let's get it going here. But before we head to space, I just want to tell you a story about how I got here, how I became an astronaut. I was just six years old when the first American astronaut launched into space. That was a long time ago, May 5th, 1961. And at my elementary school in Cleveland, Ohio, where I grew up, they brought all of us to the gymnasium. I sat on the floor, crisscross applesauce, and we all watched the launch on a small black and white TV. And as soon as our astronaut, Alan Shepard, had made it to space, I remember sitting there that morning saying, I want to do that. So ever since I was six, I knew I wanted to be an astronaut. I wanted to ride a rocket. I wanted to experience zero gravity floating around up there. And I wanted to see these sunrises and sunsets with my own eyes that the astronauts would describe. So ever since I was six, I knew I, what I wanted to do. And it took me a long time and a lot of hard work in school to get there. As a young boy, I wasn't sure how to become an astronaut. We only had seven American astronauts at that time, and I didn't know any of them. But the one thing I recognized early on was it was going to be very difficult. There was a lot of competition. Thousands of people apply to be an astronaut, and then a small handful get selected. So as a young boy, I knew my only shot of ever making it to space would have to involve me working hard and doing my best in school every single day. By chance, have you ever heard that advice before? Work hard, do your best. Work hard, do your best. Have you ever heard that? Like once or twice or like a million times? A million times. You'll hear it all the time from your teachers, your parents, your principals. And it's really good advice because you never know when something you're learning today is going to help you out in the future. So all through school, I tried to do my best in math and science, but reading, art, history, music, gym, language, whatever I was working on, I always tried to give it my 100% best effort. In an elementary school, I was an average student. I got mainly Bs, a few Cs, and a few As. In middle school, junior high, I was working a lot harder on my schoolwork, getting As and Bs. And then by the time I got to high school, I was really focused on my schoolwork, and I had nearly straight As. I had one B in the rest days. And I got those grades not because I'm the smartest guy in the world, not by a long shot, I got those grades because I worked really hard. I have a fraternal twin brother who's like a genius. He never had to study, and he got straight A's easily. 
I was one of those students that had to read the chapter, read it again, talk to my teacher or professor, study some more. But in the end, I learned it all. And I learned how to work hard, which is a great skill later on in my career. So after high school, I went on to college. I went to Case Western Reserve University in Cleveland, Ohio, and I got my bachelor's degree in physics. And that was the minimum degree you needed to become an astronaut four-year college degree in math, science, engineering, or the medical field. But again, I knew the competition was going to be tough, and I thought, I can't start applying to NASA, which is the bare minimum requirements. So I decided I'm going to stay in college. I went to Cornell University, and I got my master's and my PhD in engineering. So after about nine and a half years of college, I got out. I took a job in Princeton, New Jersey. We've got some Jersey people here. I was working in Princeton, New Jersey with a company called AT&T Bell Laboratories, doing research work for them. And this was in the early 1980s, just about when NASA was starting to launch the space shuttles. So my timing turned out to be perfect on all of this. Now, NASA selects new groups of astronauts every three or four or five years. They'll pick a small group of 10, 15, or 20 new astronauts. And it was two years after I finished college, NASA put out the announcement. They needed new astronauts. I was all excited. I wrote to them. I got the application form, carefully filled it out, sent it in, and guess what happened? They turned me down. They said, no, thanks. I was surprised. I was thinking, how could they have missed me? But I decided, oh, I'm not going to give up. I'll try again. Two years later, another astronaut selection. Got another application form, filled it out, sent it in, and then that second time, please. Who said rejected? I heard that. You guys are absolutely right. I got turned down again, but you have no faith in me. But at this point, I'm thinking, you know, my grandmother and I have the same chance of becoming an astronaut. What chance was that? Zero. I wasn't even getting close in the competition. So at this point, I realized I needed to do more to get noticed by NASA. You know, I had more than the minimum requirements, but somehow I wasn't, you know, getting in their field of view. So I knew I needed to do more, and being an engineer, what I did is I studied the data. I carefully looked at the backgrounds of the people that were successful getting in the program to try to figure out what do they have that I don't have? What am I missing here? What education, what background, what experiences? And by carefully studying that, I learned a few things. The first was most of the astronauts they were selecting already had flying experience. It wasn't a requirement, but it seemed to help a little bit. So I started taking flying lessons, and I got my pilot's license. I also noticed most of the astronauts they were selecting had some parachuting or skydiving experience. Not a requirement, but it seemed to help. So I learned to do that. I taught a university course. That seemed to be experience NASA was looking for as well. So I worked on these activities. Three years later, they had another astronaut selection. Sent my application in. And this time, NASA called me up, and they invited me down to the Johnson Space Center in Houston, Texas, for a week of medical testing and an interview. And out of the thousands of people that apply, NASA will select 100 individuals. They bring you to Houston, and you spend a full week on a very thorough medical exam, and then there's a one-hour interview. I passed all the medical tests. That one all went very well. Went on to the interview, and that went extremely well. So at the end of my week with NASA, I thought, boy, that couldn't have gone any better for me. And I went back to my job in New Jersey and just sat there and waited to see, OK, did I make it or not this time? And I was back at my job about a week or so when some of my friends started calling me up from across the country. And they called up and they said, uh, hey, Don, the FBI's been calling about you. And <laughs> let me tell you, if the FBI is ever calling about you, it's either really good or really bad, right? In this case, it was really good. NASA was doing a security background check on me. And they checked the police records. Every city, wherever I lived, they would make sure I had never been in trouble. They went and met with all my bosses. Every company that I worked for from when I was 15 years old on, they would meet with my former bosses and say, what kind of worker was Don? Did he show up to work on time? How did he treat the customers? How did he treat the coworkers? And then they went up and down the streets in any neighborhood, wherever I lived, talking to the neighbors, asking what kind of person was I? How did I treat people in the neighborhood? And when I heard this was going on, I thought, this is a great sign. 
I didn't think NASA could be doing this detailed security check on all 100 people they interviewed. I figured they must have selected their astronauts, and this is the final check to make sure you're good to go before they announce the names. So I was really excited, and it was two months later I got the phone call from NASA. They called up and said, Don, thank you very much for applying. We had a lot of good candidates. We did not select you, but good luck in the future. And I hung up that phone, and I was in shock. You know, here I had applied three times, and every time NASA turned me down. First time, no. Second time, no. Third time, they interviewed me and got to know me, but still the answer was no. It was very disappointing, and at this point I thought, hey, it's time to give up on this silly dream. I gave it my best effort. I worked hard. I applied three times, but clearly NASA wasn't interested. So I decided I'm going to go to bed, I'll get a good night's sleep, and then in the morning when I wake up, I would put together a new plan for my career that did not involve being an astronaut. So I went to bed that night. The next morning when I woke up, the very first thought that popped into my head was, I still want to be an astronaut. So I asked myself again, are there any more of these little things that I can do to improve my background, to make myself a better candidate? And once again, by studying who they were selecting and who they weren't selecting, I noticed most of the civilian astronauts that NASA was selecting, they were individuals that were already working down at the Johnson Space Center. So at this point, I quit my job in New Jersey. I got in the car. I drove to Houston, Texas. I got a job with NASA as an engineer working on the space shuttle program. Did that for three years. Then there was another astronaut selection. This is number four. Sent my application in. I got called up for the medical testing and interviews once again, and that all went very well. And then it was about three months later, I got another phone call from NASA. And this time they called up and said, Don, are you still interested in being an astronaut? Because we'd like to offer you the job. I said something really intelligent. You can quote me on this. I said, habada, 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 habada. I finally got the words yes out of my mouth. I hung up the phone. And for the next 10 minutes, I was just jumping up and down, yelling and screaming, because I knew I made it into the program. I was 35 years old when I got that call. And I started a four-year training program for my first flight. So the first time I made it to space, after dreaming of this since I was six years old, the first time I made it to space, I was 39. Now, 39 years old, that's pretty much an old man, right? Yes or no? <laughs> Parents are saying no. Some of the students are nodding their head. But for our students, let me just tell you, some of the careers you're going to pick, it's going to take, take time to get there. So a quick question for our students this morning. And raise your hand if you have an answer. What is the lesson from the story I just told you? Any lessons here? Raise your hand and stand up and yell it out. Go ahead. Never give up. Never, ever give up. You all have dreams for the future, some big dreams and small dreams. Do not give up on that. I almost gave up on my dream, and had I given up on that, I wouldn't be with you here this morning. Yes, what else? The longer the wait, the sweeter the fruit. And it took me till I was 39, but it was a pretty sweet moment when I finally made it to space. Absolutely right. Any other lessons here? Yes. Do your research. You've got to be smart about this, right? So had I been turned down and I didn't change anything, you know, am I going to get selected the next time? Probably not. So you've got to be smart. Do your research on it. Yes. Work hard and work hard and you'll succeed. Yeah, hard work is a, a really a key part of this. It takes hard work to achieve your dreams. This stuff doesn't just happen to you. Nobody just picks up the phone and says, hey, how would you like to go to space? You got to go out and work hard at it. And you got to work hard, not just Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, but every day. Yes. Be patient, right? Things take time. It took me many, many years and rejection along the way. Any other? I saw another hand over here. Work hard in school. Work hard in school, work hard out of school, work hard here, right, on your extracurricular activities. So you just want to work hard, do your best on everything. Because, you, again, you never know when something you're working on is that that's going to help you in the future. So with that, I just wanted to, you know, say hey, you hit all the high points. Work hard, do your best, 
And whatever your dream is for the future, do not give up on it. And the last piece of advice I'll tell you is never listen to somebody who tells you you can't do something. I was your age when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon in 1969. And I would tell my friends at school, I want to be an astronaut. I want to fly in space. Can you guess the reaction I got from them? They laughed. They said, ah, you can't do that. You're not smart enough, tall enough, fast enough, whatever enough. Never listen to somebody who tells you you can't do it. If you've got the passion, you work hard, you're persistent, you can accomplish anything you're, you want to in your lifetime. So I went from this little boy just dreaming of going into space to getting assigned on four space shuttle missions. This is the crew from my last flight, and the last time I was in space was 28 years ago already. Makes me feel really old to say that. But 28 years ago in July of 1997, I was aboard Space Shuttle Columbia with this crew. We've got seven astronauts, two military pilots in the front row with the helmets that help us fly the shuttle. On the left-hand side with the helmet is our commander. His name was Jim Halsell. He was an Air Force test pilot. He used to fly the SR-71 Blackbird spy plane. On the right-hand side with the helmet is our pilot. Her name is Susan Still. And Susan was a pretty unique individual. She's only the second woman to pilot the space shuttle. And Susan was one of our country's top Navy fighter pilots. So it was really a great opportunity for me to fly with her on this mission. And then in the background, we've got five of our science astronauts. We're called mission specialists and payload specialists. Our job is to do the science on board. We're trained to work the robotic arm on the shuttle if there's a need for that. We deploy satellites and do spacewalks. So we each have our area of specialty on the crew. You probably don't recognize that guy on the far right-hand side, but that's the way I used to look 28 years ago before glasses, gray hair, wrinkles, and a few pounds around the middle. I heard that. Okay. I took this picture the night before my first mission. I went out to the launch pad around midnight or so with another astronaut. And it was so amazing just to stand there, right at the base of it, all lit up with those bright lights against that pitch black sky. And as I stood there gazing up at it, I had incredible butterflies in my stomach. A little piece of me was nervous, a little piece of me was scared, but my main emotion was just great excitement. Because I knew 12 hours from when I'm taking this picture, I'm going to be strapped inside blasting off. And I almost couldn't believe where I was and what I was about to do. So they bring the astronauts out on launch morning, about three hours before liftoff. We take an elevator up. So here I am standing outside a space shuttle Columbia. They strap us into our seats one at a time. So I'm just outside here waiting, and when it's my turn, they'll call my name and say, hey, Don, we're ready for you. I'll turn that corner to the left, walk down an access arm, and there you see the round hatch or door for the shuttle. Before I climb inside, these two gentlemen in the white suits there will help me put on a parachute harness. They'll check all my equipment. Once everything looks good, I get on my hands and knees, crawl in that white board, go through the hatch, and there's a few people to strap us into our seats. We're sitting in seats similar to what you're sitting in here this morning, but because the shuttle is tilted upright, we're actually laying down on our backs. And we've got shoulder harnesses and seat belts on. They strap us in good and tight, like when your parents put you in your car seats when you were younger. Because there's a lot of shaking and vibration during launch. You don't want to bounce out of your seat and hurt yourself or damage any equipment. So they strap us in nice and tight. Once that's all done, they close and seal that side hatch and then everybody moves away from us three and a half miles. And it gets very quiet inside the shuttle up until six seconds before liftoff. At that point, three big engines at the tail of the shuttle would start coming up to full power. Six seconds later, we light our two white side rockets called solid rocket boosters. And the instant they light, boom, immediately you take off. So laying in my back in my seat, I could hear the roar of the engines. I could feel the shaking and vibration going on. And right at the instant of liftoff, I felt the push in my back. And it felt to me like somebody had their hand in the middle of my back just pushing me up into the sky. And that's what the shuttle is doing here, literally pushing us, tossing us up in the air. This picture is taken four seconds after liftoff. We're going 120 miles an hour already. So we don't ease off the launch pad. It's literally boom, and you accelerate faster and faster every second. Eight and a half minutes later, the engine shut down, it's perfectly quiet, and you're in space. It only takes eight and a half minutes to get to space. That was always amazing to me. 
I'll bet it takes many of you more than eight and a half minutes to get to school in the morning. And think about that. In that short period of time, you could end up being 200 miles above the Earth. And at this point, we're traveling at a speed of 17,500 miles an hour. That's five miles a second. So imagine how fast you could get home from the event here if you could travel five miles a second. For our teams from California, it would be no big deal, maybe six minutes to get back home. For our friends in New Jersey, it's you know maybe two minutes you could be there. And we go so fast that we orbit the Earth, we go all the way around in only an hour and a half. On three of my four missions, we had a science module in the back of the space shuttle called Space Lab very similar to our science modules today up on the International Space Station. And once we got to space, we'd open up a hatch, float through the tunnel, we could go back there and work on different experiments. So here I am with another astronaut, you know, working back in the space lab module. I want to tell you quickly about two of the experiments just to give you an idea of some of the science we do up in space. I think everybody's familiar with the shape of a candle flame here on Earth. On Earth, the flame comes up to a point because with hot air rising here on Earth, convection, it'll draw the flame up to a point. You put your hand above that flame, you'll feel the hot air coming up. You put your hand below it, it's much cooler. Well, in space without gravity, hot air doesn't rise. So instead of a flame coming up to a point, in space it'll burn perfectly round. And what you're looking at here is a little pink droplet of butane fuel. It's like what we have in a disposable lighter. And we've set it on fire, and that blue ball or halo you see there is the flame burning. And it'll just float in the air. It'll burn perfectly spherical, as you see. It'll burn up all the oxygen around itself, and then that flame will go out all on its own. We also do a lot of life science or biology experiments. In this experiment, I've got a container in my hand, and it's got a Japanese red-bellied newt, like a salamander. And the newt would lay eggs we put the eggs in the, the right-hand side of that chamber, and we just watched how the eggs grew and developed in zero gravity. They were very similar to frog eggs, developing into tadpoles and baby frogs. You'd see arms and legs and tails forming, and we would just photograph them every day looking for anything unusual that may happen in space. This is Chaki Mukai. She was the first Japanese woman in space, and I flew with her on my first mission. And in space, you don't walk around like we're used to doing here on Earth. To move around in space, it just takes a little push with your finger, and you go sailing through the air like Superman or Superwoman. And you'll keep sailing until you hit a wall or until you reach out to grab a hold of something to stop your motion. If you like doing somersaults, you can start flipping in the air. And you'll go round and round all day until you get tired and you reach out to stop your motion. So what do you think? Does it sound like fun up there? We have a blast. It's a lot of fun floating around. Here's Susan Still, the pilot on my last flight, and Susan's typing on a laptop computer. I want to point out one feature. If you look at this picture, she's got her toes hooked in that vertical gold pole. If she didn't do that with her toes, every time she hit the keyboard on the computer, what do you think would happen? She's going to go bouncing off, right? One of Newton's laws. For every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. But if she just pinches that bar a little bit, it'll stabilize herself. She can float in the air, type on the computer all day long. So space is a really fun, comfortable environment to be in. And in space, there's no up or down. I think we pretty much agree which way is up and which way is down here today. But in space, there is no up or down. And you know here on Earth, if you stand on your head, all the blood rushes to your head because of gravity. And I'm sure you felt the pressure from that. Well, that doesn't happen in space. You go upside down, you feel totally normal. And wherever your head is pointed in space, that direction is up for you. Wherever your feet are pointed, that's down. So this is Nancy and Kevin on my second flight. Nancy's looking at Kevin there saying, hey, Kevin, you're upside down. Well, Kevin's looking right back at her saying, no, you're upside down. This is what Kevin sees. In his little world, he's upright and she's upside down. So who's correct here? They're either both right or both wrong, right? You never feel like you're upside down. It's everybody else in the room. Now, in space, most of our food is freeze-dried, comes in small plastic packages like you see here. And to prepare a meal, we bring that over to a food station. There's a sharp needle that will poke into that package. You can inject hot water. That dry, hard food will soften up, and after a few minutes, it's ready to eat. And we just cut that package open with a pair of scissors and eat it with a normal fork or spoon. 
People ask me for my favorite space food. Oh, that's an easy one. None of it. You know, space food is okay. I would never go to a restaurant that had space food, but it's okay for a trip to space. Now, for drinking in space, we can't drink out of a glass or bottle. If I had a bottle of water in space, I'd take the top off, I'd tip it upside down to get a drink. Nothing's going to happen. Without gravity, that water is not going to fall or pour out of the bottle. So we can't drink out of a glass or bottle, and instead we drink out of these foil pouches like you see here. They're just like Capri Sun juice drinks, right? We've got powdered beverage, we've got powdered lemonade, powdered coffee, powdered tea. We add water to that, you mix up the powder, poke a straw in there and squeeze it into your mouth. So in this picture, I've got a bag of tropical punch in my hand. I've squeezed it a little bit, and some of the punch got away from me. And what looks like a red golf ball floating in front of my face is actually a blob of tropical punch. Any liquid in space will form a perfectly round ball. It's from a force we call surface tension. It'll drive it to a sphere, and you can go up to it and gobble it up. Our more polite astronauts will take a straw, you can poke it in there and drink it, and you'll see that blob get smaller and smaller and smaller and disappear. So here on Earth, do we ever play with our food? No, oh no. How about in space? Well, maybe sometimes, a little bit. But don't do that at home. Okay, does anybody know who flew the first pizza in space? Anybody here like pizza? Anybody know who flew the first pizza? Any guess? Me? You guys are right on here. So the first pizza in space was in April 1997. How did I get pizza in space? We don't have freeze-dried pizza. Well, on launch morning, we're allowed to carry a sandwich with us in our spacesuit out to the launch pad. Because we may be laying on our backs there for three, four, five hours waiting for liftoff. And in case we get hungry, we've got a sandwich we can, we can snack on. So for my third mission, I said, hey, instead of a turkey sandwich, could you get me a slice of pizza? I like pizza. And they said, yeah, we can do that. So they made me this little personal pizza. So if it ever comes up at trivia night, who flew the first pizza in space? You guys got this one nailed. The second part of the question is, what kind of pizza was it? Pepperoni. And people will ask me, well, was it any good? And I always say, yeah, it was A-OK. -okay. So I didn't eat it on the launch pad. I waited till I got to orbit. Sleeping in space is a little different. The inside of the shuttle is pretty small, and we didn't have a dedicated bedroom area for us. So when it's time to go to bed, we just take a sleeping bag, attach it to the wall with a few clips. You float up there, slip inside, zip it up, and you go to bed. We're wearing the dark eye shades in this picture because we go around the Earth every hour and a half. And you get 45 minutes of daylight, 45 minutes of nighttime. If you don't want the sun coming in your eyes all the time, you need to wear the eye shades. Now, for cleaning up in space, we don't have a shower, we don't have a bathtub, we don't even have a sink like you have in your kitchen or bathroom at home. So when it comes time to clean up, we've got some of those aluminum drink bags, like the Capri Sun pouches. We've got some of those, and instead of having powdered juice in them, a few of them will have powdered soap. We could add hot water, you mix up a bag of hot soapy water, we just put it on a washcloth and give ourselves a sponge bath. For washing our hair, we've got a special shampoo that you see here. It's called No Rinse Shampoo. And this stuff was developed for people in the hospital who can't get out of bed to take a shower. And it's very easy to use, doesn't require any water. All you do is squirt some of this in your hair, you work up a lather, then you take a towel, pat it dry, and you're done. I took this picture, I love the bottom line on the bottle, it's a little hard to read there, but it says, for beautifully clean, full-bodied hair. And I want to share with you what that looks like in space. Here's Susan, our pilot. Anybody with longer hair, it's going to float all over, as you see. I'm not picking on Susan. Even my short hair floats all over. And we have a saying up there. We say that every day in space is a bad hair day, and that's pretty accurate. I wanted to share with you the granddaddy of all bad hair days in space. You guys ready for this? You sure? You better hold on. So... This is Marsha Ivins. She was the speaker here last year, right? Maybe some of you heard. Maybe she showed this picture. But uh, definitely a bad hair day. And she wouldn't leave it like this normally. Otherwise, for the rest of us, it'd be like scuba diving through seaweed. She'd put it in a ponytail, but just did this for the picture. I forgot I had this one in there. You guys know what this is? Yeah, skip this. We'll skip this. You guys want to hear about it? 
Wow, this is a good group here. All right, this is the toilet on board the space shuttle. It's in a small closet area, uh, very similar to an airline toilet. We've got a curtain that goes across the front, like a shower curtain for privacy. And it's got a white toilet seat like our toilets on Earth. But here on Earth, we use gravity to collect the waste material. You could probably imagine what would happen in space, and I won't be describing that here today. But this toilet is like a porta potty. You may see it at a football game or a construction site. And in the bowl of the toilet, we have giant fans. And to activate the toilet, there's a little knob off to the side. You push it forward, it activates those fans, and it sucks air from the toilet seat downward. So we use that down rush of air to act like gravity to keep all the waste material down. And that's the secret of the space toilet. I'll wrap it up by showing you some pictures of the Earth. And whenever, whenever an astronaut has a free moment, we'd float to the window to watch the Earth go by. I've got a map in my hand here. I'm trying to figure out where we are around planet Earth. And I'm looking out one of the windows towards the tail end of the space shuttle. And I took a camera right up to the window. I pressed it against the glass, and I took a picture so you can see exactly what my eyes are seeing. And this is the view I see out the back. So there is the beautiful blue Earth from 200 miles up. All the blue in this image is the Pacific Ocean. The white areas are puffy clouds. That peninsula coming down from the upper right-hand corner is Baja, California, part of Mexico. So San Diego, California would just be to the upper right-hand corner of the picture. And I don't know if it shows up very well, but at the bottom edge of the Earth, there's a little thin blue line. Can you see that today? Any guess as to what that blue line is? Yeah. That's our atmosphere. You know, on a nice sunny day like we have today in Sheboygan, you look up at that blue sky, it looks like it goes on forever and ever. From space, we're looking at the atmosphere edge on. And it looks just like you see here. It looks like a paper-thin layer. Most of the air protecting us here on planet Earth is in that first 15, 20 miles or so. And that's about it, which is why when we pollute the air, it can have such a major impact on our planet. Here's a big hurricane. I saw many storms when I was up there. This was a big one over the Pacific Ocean, about 400 miles across. And we flew right over the center of it. That's called the eye, right? From 200 miles up, I could go to the window, look straight down, look right into the eye, and see the blue water of the Pacific Ocean. The next picture will show you the eye looking straight down from directly overhead, right there. Looks a little bit like an eye, right? Here's a volcano venting steam. This is in the South Pacific near Indonesia. And here you see the Himalaya Mountains. And right at the center, right there, that's Mount Everest, tallest mountain on planet Earth. Now, I can stand up here in front of you this morning and tell you without lying, I have seen the top of Mount Everest with my own eyes about 25 times during my missions. I'm sensing you're not too impressed by that. I call it the lazy man's way to see the top of Mount Everest, right? No climbing involved, just cruising overhead at 18,000 miles an hour as I drink my tang. But I use this picture to illustrate some of the things I got to see and do during my career. I've never climbed Mount Everest. I never will in my lifetime, but I've seen the top of it many times. I've seen the Great Barrier Reef off Australia, the Amazon rainforest down in Brazil and South America. I've seen Mount Kilimanjaro, big volcanic peak, poking up through the clouds. So many amazing sights around planet Earth. Anybody recognize this incredible part of the planet? That's Lake Michigan there. Put in a few cities, you see Chicago, at the southern shore there, and then uh, Milwaukee. And just a little bit north of there, Sheboygan. Looks like a great day to launch rockets, right? And here's Milwaukee uh, during the day. I just want to show you, it's in Milwaukee at nighttime. So it's really amazing to see all the city lights at night. And here's a sunrise from space. Because we go around the Earth every hour and a half, we see 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every 24-hour day up there. Well, at the end of the mission, it's time to come home. We'd fire two engines in the back of the shuttle. It would slow our speed down from like 17,500 miles an hour. We would slow our speed down to about 17,000 miles an hour. And it sounds like we're still going fast, but at that speed, the shuttle breaks out of orbit and begins its fall back to Earth. And about 55 minutes later, we would end up landing at a runway at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. 
touch, touching down like an airplane, we would deploy that drag parachute out the back, put the brakes on, and we just roll to a stop. And then we just sit in our seats and wait for them to open the hatch to let us out. And when you first come back from space, you feel like you weigh about 2,000 pounds because you've been floating around weightless for two weeks, and then suddenly you come back to this pull of gravity. Just a normal pull we're feeling in here today, but it felt so heavy for me. My arms were heavy, my legs were heavy, I was a little dizzy when I got back. And it took a day or so for that dizziness to go away, maybe a week or so to get your muscle strength back, and then you're pretty much back to normal. So this picture was taken two hours after I landed on my first flight. I'm there on the left-hand side. And after we took this picture, I remember I turned around and I looked up at the word Columbia there on the side of the shuttle, and I was just staring back at it thinking, what an amazing vehicle this is. You know, this was my house in space for two weeks. This thing protected me from that fiery reentry coming in through the atmosphere. And then the next thought that popped into my head was, I gotta do this again. And it's like going on a great roller coaster. I don't know if any of you do this where you get off the ride, you run around, get back in line and do it again immediately. Does anybody else do that or just me? Yeah, some of you out here. And that's exactly how I felt. As soon as I landed, I thought, wow, I got to do this again. And I went on to fly a total of four times. So the space shuttles are all retired now. They're all in museums. But we still have the International Space Station orbiting overhead, right, about 250 miles up. We currently have these seven astronauts up there. So we have four, four Americans, or three Americans, four Americans and three Russians that are currently up there. And they live up there for six to 12 months at a time. Today, NASA's working on new rockets called the Space Launch System. And I think you can learn about these from our NASA guests on the other side of the curtain here. But these are the biggest, most powerful rockets that will ever be launched you know, by NASA. And instead of flying our astronauts on a space plane like the shuttle, they'll fly on top on a small capsule called the Orion that'll hold four to six astronauts. And the first test launch of this new rocket, Space Launch System, was in November of uh, 2022, so about a year and a half ago. And what we did, we launched from the Kennedy Space Center, and we sent this rocket unmanned, so no astronauts on board, sent it in orbit around the moon for a few weeks, brought it back, and uh, after all the tests, they said, hey, it went pretty well. The, the rocket actually went, the capsule flew 40,000 miles beyond the moon. And this picture I love, this is a picture 40,000 miles from the moon. You look in the distance there, you see the moon, and a quarter of a million miles farther away is planet Earth. How would you like to see that view? I would love to see something like that. So our Artemis II mission, we're going to launch in November of next year, and we're going to have four astronauts on board. They're going to do an Earth orbit mission. They're going to do a deep space orbit, so they'll go out to about 1,000 miles orbit the Earth for a week or so, and then they're going to fire an engine and loop around the backside of the moon. And these are the four astronauts that will be on that mission. We've got uh, Christina Cook. We've had 24 men go to the moon back in the 60s when I was your age. Christina Cook will be the first woman to go to the moon, orbit around the backside. Victor Glover is one of our Navy, top Navy test pilots. He'll be the first African-American flying to the moon. We have Jeremy Hansen, he's a Canadian that will be on board. And the mission is headed up by Commander Reed Weissman. <coughs> Artemis III will be a few years after that, maybe in four or five years. And we're going to land two astronauts on the south pole of the moon. <coughs> Excuse me. And NASA's committed to having one man and one woman on that landing crew. So again, 12 astronauts have walked on the moon, all men. And we're just a handful of years away from having the first woman walking on the moon. I think that's pretty exciting. They're landing on the south pole of the moon because down there, there's some deep, deep craters that are in permanent shadow. The sunlight never gets down to the bottom of those craters. And at the bottom of those craters, we know there's water ice from comets that might have bombarded the moon millions of years ago. From that water ice, we can get drinking water. We can get hydrogen and oxygen. Oxygen for the astronauts to breathe and hydrogen and oxygen, great rocket fuel. So there's great resources for us to use at the South Pole. We currently have 18 astronauts training for these missions down at the Johnson Space Center. Nine men and nine women. So one of those nine women here that you see will be the first woman to walk on the moon in just a handful of years. I think she's going to be famous like Neil Armstrong. 
So where are we going with these new rockets and capsules? I told you the moon. We'd also like to go on to visit the asteroids and then go on to the planet Mars. And about maybe 20 years from now, we're hoping to land astronauts on the surface of Mars. And here in this picture, you see a, an artist's drawing of that day. You see the landing craft. And just to the right of it, you see the shadowy figure of the first two humans setting foot on Mars. And do you know who those astronauts are? Any guests? Yeah, well, let me tell you, it's not me. I'm too old to go to Mars. 22 year, or 20 years from now, I'm going to be 89, so NASA's not sending me to Mars. I'm too old to go to Mars. Your parents are all too old to go to Mars. And for any teachers or mentors here, please cover your ears. Your teachers and mentors are all way too old to go to Mars. But for our students here today, you're the perfect age. We call you the Mars generation. And it'll be somebody in your generation here to be that first human to set foot on Mars. And that's why we say at NASA, like, we need you. You are the next generation of scientists, engineers, technicians, medical professionals, astronauts, and explorers. And we'll never get to, to Mars without your help in the future. And that's why I'm so thrilled that you guys are here participating in this program and working hard in school. And I'll just, I just hope you continue working hard, do your best every single day that, so that you can help us out with these missions in the future. One last thing. What I brought with me here today and I have in my hand is a really tiny, small piece of the planet Mars. Now, how did I get a piece of Mars? We haven't brought back any Mars rocks or anything. But every now and then, an asteroid slams into Mars, kicks up Mars rocks. They travel through space. And every now and then, they land on Earth as a meteorite, a shooting star. From the chemistry of this rock, we know for sure, 100% certain, this is a piece of Mars. Because we have rovers on Mars. We know the chemistry of Mars rocks. So this is an actual piece of planet Mars. I'm going to leave it with Kenny here. And over today and tomorrow, I hope uh, maybe you could pass this around. You could pry off the top, and you can each touch Mars. And then you could say, when somebody asks you, how many planets have you touched? What are you going to say? Yeah. Two, Earth and Mars. So I'll leave this with you. My challenge to all of our students here today is to bring back a bigger piece. OK? I challenge you to go out and do that. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. You guys have been a great group here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Kenny's got another microphone. We'll bring it around if you have any questions, anything you'd like to ask here today. So a gentleman back there raised his hand. Come on up here. So we got about a uh, solid 15, 16 minutes here. So come on up. All right, your question. Uh, when like the rocket gets into space, space, <coughs> sorry. Who is like controlling the rocket to like go around the Earth? Yeah, once we get to space, and that's only eight and a half minutes, the engines shut down. And if we're going this magic speed of 17,500 miles an hour, the space shuttle is in orbit. And it just goes around the Earth. No engines are firing. Just like the moon goes around the Earth without engines, the shuttle does that. So we're just in this orbit. We can control our orbit. We can change the parameters a little bit. Uh, it takes a lot of fuel to do a major change in orbit, but we're in control of that, and we have the team on the ground, our mission control team. You know, your team, you'll learn about that up here. You have a mission control team as well for your rocket launches. That is the team that's helping us. They're tracking our orbit. They know exactly where we're at. But once we get to space, the engine shut down, we're in an orbit. Okay? All right, great job. Um, just so everybody knows, too, I want to remind everybody that we do have extra photographs and uh, bios for Dr. Um, over on the table over there. So uh, great discussion. So anyone that is not a participant or part of the public here that would like a photo, they're over on that table. So your question, sir. So like when you're waiting for launch and you're in the show, or like when you're waiting for them to open in the hatch after landing, what do you do then like to pass the time? You know, when we get inside the shuttle and we get in like two and a half hours or so before launch, 
we get in there, we're doing communication checks. Um, we're, we're getting strapped in. They seal the hatch. They're doing a leak check to make sure there's no leaks. And then there's about an hour in there where we got nothing to do. And so we'll, we're just in there like chit-chatting, telling stories. You'll tell a joke. You'll get the biggest laugh from the stupidest joke because everybody's got this nervous energy. But the last hour before launch, there's no more talking, no more joking around. We're focused on the countdown. And we only speak if there's something related to the mission. If I saw something that needed to be taken care of, then I would speak. But that would be a really bad time to tell a, a stupid joke. And when we land in the shuttle, it's, it's very similar. We land, we got about an hour before they're going to open the hatch. I would try to stand up and just get my legs working again. My first flight, I landed it. I tried to lift my foot off the floor of the shuttle. And I can only lift it an inch or two. And I'm thinking, what's going on? Is it stuck in gum or caught on a cable? And I look down there, and there's nothing holding my foot back. But my muscles were weaker from being in space. And more importantly, my brain forgot how much force it takes to lift my foot under gravity. If I ask you to lift your right arm this morning, your arm will shoot up in the air. You don't even think about it. If you go to space and come back, I say, lift your right arm. You're going to go, whoa, you could do it, but it's really heavy. So at that hour, you know, we're trying to get used to gravity again. Stand up a little bit, get your balance. We have a few switches we have to throw to power things down, but we're just anxiously waiting for them to open that hatch so that we can come out. All right, I got, uh, I'm gonna ask him a personal question that I learned last night before jumping on. Explain how you met your wife on the Vomit Comet. Yeah, we have a, an airplane at NASA where we fly a zero gravity flights. People think NASA has a room where we can flip a switch and float around in there and then turn gravity back on. You can't do that. So the way we simulate zero gravity, we have an airplane that just goes up and does these parabolas, up and down. And if you've ever been on a roller coaster, as you're coming over the top of the hill, sometimes you feel like you're coming out of your seat. And you're getting a little bit weightless there. So this plane, as it pitches over the top of one of these arcs, we get about 20 to 30 seconds of zero gravity time. And I flew on that plane one time when I was, uh, before I'd flown in space, one of the new astronauts. And my wife was on there performing some experiments. So I met her on, on the zero gravity plane. The nickname for that plane is the Vomit Comet, because a lot of people get sick, air sick from that. So what a great romantic story, right? Meeting your, your wife on the Vomit Comet. All right. See, blind dates, Vomit Comet, it all, all goes down. Yes, sir, your question. Um, how did it feel to go, to go 17,000 miles an hour? Yeah, once we get to space, we're going 17,000 miles an hour. We shut the engines down, and you're just floating. You're just floating in zero gravity. You can't tell you're going that fast. The only way you can tell you're going that fast is you look out the window and you see, instead of cities going by like on an airplane, you see countries or continents floating, floating by. Because we're not passing any stop signs or anything, you can't really get a sense of your speed. Only when you look at the Earth. We crossed the United States from California to New Jersey in only eight, eight minutes. So, but otherwise, you just feel like you're in some room and they flipped off gravity, and that's it. You have no sense of speed, though. All right, next question. So you said the rocket, in like a span of like four seconds, it goes 120 miles per hour, which is like pretty fast. So do you have any idea what motors NASA uses like in their rockets or space shuttles? Yeah, the space shuttles uh, had the three main engines. Um, they were built to be reusable, and we're using those same engines today on the Artemis, the space launch system rockets. And then the solid rocket boosters are just like giant versions of the rockets that you have here. They have solid propellant you know, built into them. Uh, those are manufactured out in Utah uh, for, with a company out there. And after each mission, they would have to send the casings back out there. They would load them up with new fuel. The fuel uh, in the solid rocket motors had the consistency of a, an eraser, you know, kind of a rubbery material. It had am ammonium perchlorate and aluminum particles that it would burn for, for the propellant there. All right, you asked about the ammonia, but chloride and the motors. We actually have two demonstration rockets that will be going off this weekend. They both have, I don't want to say homemade, we, we build our own motors. So Scani Motors, Eric, who's doing the judging on the rockets, 
made the motors for the event. So if you want to see a really cool motor, it's a sparky motor with titanium and the ammonia perchlorate in it. So the next question. Uh, could you go crazy from staying in space for too long? Could you go crazy for staying in space too long? My wife might have an answer for you, but you know, they keep us pretty busy up there. We've had a few astronauts that have spent uh, a year in space. And you would think a year in a really small, closed environment like that, you know, how, how do you not go crazy? But they keep you really busy. You know, the astronauts, we enjoy looking out the window, as I told you, watching the planet. Up on the space station, they have an internet Skype type telephone. So they can call anybody they want to around the planet pretty much 24 hours a day. So you can call your friends and family and kind of stay connected. So things like that really help that you don't go crazy up there. When uh, we send astronauts to Mars, and who's going to Mars? Me? You guys, when you go to Mars, that's about a, a three-year round trip, okay? It'll be about six to eight months to get to Mars, six to eight months to get back, and you're going to spend about two years on Mars, and uh, that's going to be a long trip. So, you know, hopefully you can call home, take some movies, video games, you know, things to do to keep yourself entertained up there. How many planets have you seen while in space? How many planets have I seen up there? That's a really good question. From, from the space shuttle, I've seen Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. I couldn't see Uranus, Neptune, or uh, what, which one? I'm, I'm just Pluto. I couldn't, I couldn't see them. That You need a telescope to really see them at all. But I could see Mercury you know, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. They look the same as they do here. They look like bright stars. The sun is brighter in space than when you see it here on Earth. It's just not here on Earth. It's filtered a little bit, scatters some of the light from our atmosphere. But in space, you're looking directly at the sun. It's so bright, you can't even glance at it for a second. The one thing that are different in space are the stars. Here on Earth, the stars twinkle, right? It's from the light coming through the atmosphere, causing this shimmering or twinkling effect. Up in space, we're up above the atmosphere. So the stars are steady, steady pinpoints of light. So you'll never hear an astronaut singing that twinkle, twinkle little star song. We don't sing that up in space at all. That's a joke. Okay. So um, on the, before you actually take off, what is the actual spacesuit? What does it feel like? Is it heavy, relatively light? Um, the spacesuit? Yeah. The orange suits that we wear, they're called launch and entry suits. We wear them for launch and landing. And they weigh about maybe 30 to 40 pounds or so. People ask, is it, is it comfortable? Oh, no, it's not comfortable. It's really hot. The inner layer of a spacesuit is a rubberized fabric like a balloon to keep the air around your body, right, so it doesn't leak out. So because of that, they don't breathe very well. So they're very hot and sweaty. When I'm laying on my back in my seat for launch, I'm laying on top of a parachute, a lumpy parachute with oxygen bottles in there. And I have that parachute in case there's a problem. You know, we can't make it to the runway. We could blow out the side hatch and jump out and parachute down. So the whole experience of launch, it's kind of uncomfortable. But even if I'm laying on my back for four hours there and my back's getting a little sore from being on that lumpy parachute, I would never say, hey, I got to get out and stretch, you know. It's like, I can take this for another two, three, four, five, six hours until we launch. So you're just really anxious to go and get the mission started. Okay. Uh, are there any laws you have to follow? Like, do you have to follow the laws of the United States while you're in space? Any laws? Yeah. Do you have to follow any laws like this, laws of the United States while in space? Boy, that's a good question. You know, there, there's an area of, of law called space law. We have international agreements from country to country um, that we follow up there. But I don't know, we've never had an incident of somebody, you know, killing somebody or hurting somebody and then they, you know, come back and, and try to sue. None of that's ever happened. So in practice, you know, we're probably following American law. But there's also many, many of these international laws that we follow. We have agreements with countries. One of the laws that we have, when I was a young boy, you know, we'd launch rockets and the upper stage of the rockets, maybe the satellite separates from it, and that upper stage would have some residual fuel in there. And after an hour or a day, that fuel would build up pressure and that stage would explode. 
And that upper stage, one piece, would become a thousand pieces of space debris. And that would take a long time to fall back in the atmosphere. So because of that, we'd, we'd prefer to have a big rocket stage up there. It has a lot of drag, and it's going to fall back to Earth sooner than if it blew up into a thousand pieces. So we have agreements with China, Russia, and other uh, countries that are launching rockets. Once you get to space, once you separate your upper stages, we, we vent our fuel so that they don't become many, many pieces of space debris. All right, so you're saying you're not any space pirate? I'm saying... I said you're not Mark Watney, space pirate, international law. You know. Yeah, nothing okay. like that. There you go. How do you get your exercise? How do we get our exercise? On the space shuttle, we had a, a small bicycle we'd ride every day for about 45 minutes. It would get your heart muscle going, get your leg muscles working, so that when you come back to Earth, you're still in good shape. We'd set this bicycle up under these big windows. They had two big windows in the shuttle. And after, as I would pedal the bike, I could lean back a little bit and look out the windows. And in 45 minutes of riding this bike, you'd go halfway around the planet. So as you're pedaling away, you look out and maybe you see Australia goes by or Africa goes by the window. Some of the astronauts used to make a big deal about it. They would say, I want to bicycle across the Pacific Ocean. If you ever hear that claim, don't be impressed. It only takes about 15 minutes. Today up on the space station, our astronauts exercise two to three hours a day because they're up there a long time. They've got a bicycle, they've got a treadmill that they run on, they've got some resistive exercise, weight training. They don't have free weights because that would be simple in zero gravity, but it's like a barbell tied to springs and pulleys, and it's that resistive exercise that puts force on your bones that stimulates them to grow. Astronauts lose about 1% of their bone every month in space. So by doing this resistive exercise, we can strengthen our bones, cause them to grow in space, and try to keep them at a normal level. All right, we're going to have two more questions. Here's one. What was your most, or what was your grossest and most powerful moments in space? The grossest moment? Boy, you know, you're, you're up there with six other people for two weeks, and I think, um, the grossest would be one of my crew members took one of those drink bags and he wanted to have fresh sprouts to put on his little space food up there. So he wanted to grow his own sprouts like you'd get at a salad bar somewhere. So he took these little seeds, he added water when he got to space and these sprouts started growing. He forgot about them and they were growing and growing and there was some fermentation in there. And after about 10 days of the mission, this, that foil pouch split open. And everywhere inside the shuttle, it just smelled like putting your head in a toilet. And everybody was like, oh my god, you know, what happened here? And you know, told this guy, don't, don't do that again. You know, leave your sprouts on Earth. That was the, the, the grossest, and you said the most memorable moment? Par powerful moment. Powerful moment. You know, for sheer power for me, uh, on my first mission, I had been in space maybe 10 days of a 15-day flight. And I was looking out the window at the Earth. You know, maybe it was a nighttime pass, and I'm just looking out the window. And I had tears in my eyes, and it, it just dawned on me. I said to myself, hey, Don, you made it. You know, I had dreamed of this. I told you that story. I had dreamed of this my whole life. And here I am, 39 years old, and I, it finally dawned on me. I had a minute to reflect, and I said, you made it. And I don't pat myself on the back, I don't do that at all, but this was a moment where I just congratulated myself. Like I was almost overcome with the emotion of, I accomplished that, that dream. It wasn't until 10 days into the flight. After we launched into space, I didn't have that moment like that, but it took about 10 days, and then I realized, wow, wow, you did it. And it's a really cool feeling. All right, our last question. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So on Earth, the higher something is, the more gravitational potential energy it is. And when you drop that, it gets converted into kinetic energy. In space, is there a different kind of energy that gets converted into gravitational potential energy when you enter the Earth's atmosphere or its gravity? It, it's the same. It's just a gravitational energy that gets converted into kinetic energy. 
So we start off, you know, going 17,000 miles an hour. As we're falling back, we're gaining more speed, but we're hitting the atmosphere that's slowing us down. And we convert all that energy, all that speed, that kinetic energy and even the potential energy, we convert it into heat. And this, the shuttle starts glowing. We get a plasma around us as we're hitting the atmosphere, and we just dissipate all that heat that way. Kenny, I don't know if you remember, there was a question you were asking me last night, and I told you. Oh, is the, nobody asked it. It's uh, how do you go to the bathroom in space? No, that, that one, but I get asked the question, what does space smell oh, like? Oh, yes, the space Have you ever smell. heard this question before? It became popular on the internet, and, and I tell people, like, hey, space is a vacuum, right? There's nothing there, so it can't have any smell at all. But I'll tell you the story. On my last flight, I landed on Space Shuttle Columbia, and uh, we were going to spend the night at the Kennedy Space Center. We, like, we landed late in the day, and NASA said, we'll fly you back to your homes in Houston the next day. So we landed in Kennedy Space Center. They were going to keep us there. So that evening, my wife and I went out to dinner in, in Cape Canaveral, and I wanted to get something that was non-freeze-dried. So we went to a restaurant that had like buffalo wings. I wanted something a little spicy too. So I'm eating my buffalo wings, and I look across the restaurant, and there was the guy, the gentleman who had opened the hatch of the shuttle when we landed. And I knew him, he was a friend of mine. So I walked over across the restaurant and I said, hey Bill, uh, Thanks so much for supporting our mission. I appreciate everything you did for us. I said, I have a question for you. When you open the hatch at the end of the mission, does it stink? He looked down at his food, and he's just shaking his head, saying, no, no, no. Because astronauts can't stink, right? Right? Right. So I knew he was lying, and I pressed him on it. I said, come on, be honest. He looks up at me. He says, it stinks so bad. We have a full toilet. We've got bags of dirty laundry from two weeks. We've got bags and bags of garbage up there. It has to stink. But I had to ask the question. I didn't know. You know, you just adapt to your environment. And the fact that I had to ask, does that stink? Like, it just tells you how much that you adapt to your environment there. But I have it on really good authority that, yes, it does stink <laughs> up in space. OK. All right. Hey, thank good. you all very thank much. You. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. And I'll leave that with you there.